Okay, so now we've got the software installed. We've got our own wallet created. We know how to use the wallet and import keys into it. What do we do next? Well, now I'm going to give you some boilerplate code and show you how to compile a very basic contract, just a contract with basically nothing in it, just to show you how to actually set one up and compile it. And then once we have that figured out and you have that process sorted out, you already solved like 90% of the hardest stuff. That's like the hardest part is getting all this stuff set up. So once we've got that under control and situated, after that, then I'm going to teach you how to actually code stuff. But for right now, let's just jump into the process of how to actually set this up and compile it. Okay, so as you can see here on the screen, we finally got some actual code to look at. Although this doesn't actually really do anything. This is very basic. But I'm going to walk you through what each one of these things is and, you know, why this looks like this. I'm just going to walk you through each line of code. This is just a basic, basic boilerplate template. But if you get this part sorted out, you're pretty much off to the races after this. After that, all you need to do is learn how to actually do like specific things. But this is a great starting point if you can just understand what you have laid out here and how to interact with it. And by the way, I'm a big fan of just copy and pasting when you finally learn like how something works and how to do it. You don't need to know the exact syntax of every little thing. Um, like this whole thing that I'm highlighting right here. If I didn't just copy this the first time I figured it out, I probably, I wouldn't know how to like write this without copying it right now. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Once you get something to work, just spam it over and over again and customize it to suit your own needs. You don't need to know the exact amount of semicolons and you know every little quotation mark that you need to put. Just, I'll have a link to this uh, exact code in the description of the video so that you can just copy this and then you can modify it as a starting point whenever you want to create something. And then after that, that's when you need to actually know how to write some code. All right. So um, right at the top here, you can see that pretty much I'm just including a bunch of stuff. Now, this code that we have underneath here, this is all like, this is great. This is stuff that we can write ourselves, right? But how does any of this work? Like, what's it built on? Well, it's built on all this stuff up here. We're basically importing a bunch of libraries. Uh, there's a bunch of code that's already been written for us by the EOS team or the, you know, the WAX team or the developers who created all this stuff. Uh, that, that just goes on behind the scenes. We don't need to write that ourselves. We don't need to know what it is or really how it works. But all that stuff is necessary for our contract to work. So that's why we're including this stuff up here. Uh, we probably don't even need to include all these, to be honest, because I deleted most of what was in this contract beforehand. But um, whatever, I'm just going to leave them there for now. So next, just using namespace EOSIO, maybe not even entirely necessary, but this basically tells the rest of the contract that, hey, um, when we write something and we define something, it's, it's within the EOSIO namespace. If you know what C++ is and, and how it works, then I don't really need to explain this to you. And if you don't, then um, it's probably not quite that important. But when you see things like this right here, EOSIO, colon, colon, and then the word contract, just know that you're going to be having to do this quite a bit um, if you don't know how this stuff works with the namespaces. Like, for instance, down here, I write standard string message instead of just writing string. Uh, that's because we're using the EOSIO namespace. But to be honest, most people will say that it's better practice anyway to just to always put these uh, namespaces and colons before you write your variable names and stuff. Um, it's, it's just a good habit to get into. So whatever, that's probably not that important. Um, next, we're just basically defining our contract class. So that's from this bracket right here and everything inside of it for the rest of our contract is down here. All this stuff is within the contract class that we're defining right here. So basically just copy and paste this line and change the word code tutorial to whatever you want to call your contract. Do it here and then also do it in this other spot right here. And then once you do that, the rest of your contract will actually work. All right, so now that we've defined our contract class, we're gonna say using contract. And uh, I just went over what that means. So all that stuff's really not that important. 
Um, but next, uh, this is the important stuff right here. So this is how you define an action. EOSIO action within these brackets right here. And then you're going to create a function right underneath it. So you're basically saying, this is a blockchain action that I want to define right now. I want people to be able to do something on the blockchain, like, you know, go on the block explorer and, and actually do this action. And that action is going to be this stuff right here, right? So you define a function, this function returns a void. That just basically means it's not going to return anything to us. It just does something and then it's done. We don't need anything back from it. Uh, and then it's going to take in these variables right here. So I haven't actually written out this function yet, but let's say we're taking in a user and an ID and a string, right? So let's say that, first of all, we want this to only be able to be executed by whoever this user is. So um, we're going to say require auth. user right this means we need the permission of whoever this user is that gets entered here we need their they need to sign a transaction in order to do this this add message function that we're going to create if someone types mike d crypto 5 into this box right here and it says name user you know let me show you what i'm talking about if we go on blocks this is what i mean when i say someone types this in if we go on blocks and we go to, let's just say we go to the EOSIO contract. We go to the contract and there's this tab called actions here. If we click on actions, there's all these different actions, right? Now there's no add message because that's just something I'm creating in the contract, but let's pretend it was here. Let's just say, um, let's click one of these random actions, reg proxy, or here we go, set priv, whatever this is. You can see it asks for two things. It asks for an account name and is priv. So in the contract here, when we're asking for a user, right here on blocks is where you would see this. Instead of account, it would say user. So you'd say, you know, Mike D Crypto 5. And since I'm putting this require auth user thing here, what that means is if someone types this in and they try to click submit transaction on our contract, it will not allow the transaction to execute unless Mike D Crypto 5 is the one who signed it. So if you have like a specific transaction that you don't want anyone else to be able to execute, like maybe somehow it uh, modifies some information that's meant to be controlled by you, you could put require auth and then in quotes put my account, whatever your, you know, wax account name is, and then underscore n. That's how you, that's how you define a name. You can't just put, you can't just put it in quotes. You have to put underscore n if you, if you're actually writing out the account name. So if you wrote it out like this, this would require the authorization of whatever, whoever owns my account on wax blockchain. Um, I don't know if that, it's not found, but you get the point. That's how you require somebody to sign something. So let's just say require auth user. Now, next we're taking in this ID right here. This is just a number that the person's going to type in. Um, this it's just a sample action. It's not really doing anything important, by the way. And now, the whole thing that we're going to make this do is we're going to make it add a message into this table that I've defined down here. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, but that ID needs to be unique to this table. You can't have the same ID twice. Um, so let's just say we don't really need to do anything with that, actually. And then next we have a string. And this is going to be the message that we're going to add to this messages table. You can see we have a, a field here called standard string and message. So Maybe we want to, I don't know, let's make sure that the, the message is actually, oops, I have to type message there. Let's make sure that the message is, I don't know, more than 10 characters or less than 100. How about both of those? What we can do is say check. This is how you check stuff within a contract, a semicolon at the end. And then first we're going to type the condition. So let's say we want to check message dot 
length is greater than or equal to 10 and message dot length is less than or equal to 100 so those are the two conditions we're going to check uh, if this if the conditions are not both met then this is going to fail the transaction is not going to go through it's just going to give an error to the user when they try to submit it it's going to say what's it going to tell the user though well we're about to define that right now because the second part of this that we have to put in these parentheses we put a comma and then now we put the error message in quotes so we say check these conditions then comma and in quotes we say um your message was either too long or too short so now if the message passes these conditions and we have the authorization of the user now we want to actually put this information into the table that we've defined down here i call this tutorial you know to be honest i should have called this table messages so let's call it messages 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 and then that's the actual name but then we have to give it like a name that we're gonna refer to it as up up in the action up there so we'll say msg underscore table um don't worry too much about this just yet but this is basically me defining a table so a table is a struct you have to put it in this eosio.table brackets here and then you put the name of the table messages and then inside these brackets here you're going to put the different rows or the different columns i should say that are going to go on the table we're going to have the primary key which is going to be id and then the message so i'm just creating a table called messages here it's going to have two columns an id column and a message column and then we define the primary key uh, which is just going to be the id field and we're referring to this in our contract though as msg table so, all right, now we want to in place info into table. So what we're gonna do is message, we have to initialize the connection with the table. So we'll say message table, and then we'll give it a name to refer to it as. So we'll just say MSGs. And then, all right, there's two things that we have to define in here. And don't worry too much if you're a little lost right now, you'll understand in a second. The first thing that we have to define is what contract is this table even on, right? I mean, we're defining a table, but or we're, we're calling a table, but where is it? Is it on our contract or someone else's contract? We don't know that automatically. We have to tell the contract where to look. So we're going to say it's on our contract. And you can, you can define that by just saying get self with parentheses, with parentheses Get self is basically just a function that's built into the EOSIO library that allows you to get your own username basically without having to write out like your username. Uh, you're going to use this a lot, so get familiar with it. All right, and then we have to put a comma. And then the second thing we have to define here is the scope. Like we know the contract that the table is on. We know the name of the table. But what's the scope that we're looking in? You might be a little confused by what a scope even is, but that's fine. We'll get into it in a little bit. I'll explain more about how that all works. But for now, we're just going to put get self dot, dot value. So this means we're looking on our contract for the table. And then the scope that we're looking in here is get self or our username dot value. I'm not going to go too deep into what this all means right now because I'm going to cover it more in a little bit. But real quickly i'll just give you like a quick look so if we go to blocks and we go to a token contract that has multiple tokens on it uh let's say e dot r planet i think they have a few tokens on there and then we go to the contract itself all right so if we go to accounts the the table here there's a table called accounts right this lists all their different tokens you can see they have APH, RDAO, we can. There's like seven different tokens here. Now you can see the scope right here says E dot R planet. So on this particular table, everything's within one scope. Like you just have to look through this little lens called E dot R planet 
And you can find all these things within that lens, you know, looking through that scope. But let's say we went over to the stat table here. This is where you're going to find the information for each token that's on their contract. You look through this scope and you see that there's nothing, you know, like, where is it? Where's all the information about these coins? Well, that's because the scope that they're using is the actual name of the coin. So if we type in APH here and we look through this lens, we can get the supply and the max supply of APH. Or if we type Aether as the scope, we can get the Aether supply and the max supply. So when you say scope, basically you're just defining like a, a lens that you want to look through. Where's the stuff? Right? That's what we're defining right here when we say get self dot value. That's the scope. All right. So real quick again, name of the table, a little whatever we're going to call it right here, messages, the contract where the table is located, and the scope that we're looking at. So now we've initialized the connection there. We've defined, you know, how to access this table and scope. And now we have to actually in place the information. So I always mess this up, but it's msgs dot in place. This means we want to add info. I'm going to have to cheat and look at something because they always mess up the syntax. Okay. The first thing that you want to enter is the RAM payer. The RAM payer, if you want to be the person who pays RAM, and we're just going to say that you do for now because it's easier that way. I'll teach you how to change that later. First person, first argument is the RAM payer. So in place, RAM payers get self, and then comma. And then we're basically creating a Lambda expression here, which just allows us to uh, access all this stuff without actually writing out a function. Um, so we say auto and row. So pretty much what we just did was initialize the connection to the table. And now we're creating this function where we're going to actually add stuff to the table. So we're referring to each row in the table as row now because we just defined that right here in the Lambda expression. So we're going to say row dot. And remember, we have an ID and a message field in here. So if we want to add an ID to the table, we're going to say row dot ID. And we'll say equals, and we want it to be equal to this ID up here that we took in um, when the person entered it. So we'll say row dot ID equals ID. Now, this isn't typically the way you do it, I guess. You, you don't really have a person define their own ID. I just did that to kind of show you guys how that works. But normally how you'd probably do it is there's a function built into the library where you can just type row dot ID equals and the name of the table that you just defined here. So msgs dot available underscore primary key. If you do it that way, what it's basically going to do is it's going to check the messages table. It's going to look for a unique primary key that doesn't exist yet. An available primary key, duh. And that's what it's going to make it. So you don't have to worry about like a duplicate causing an error or letting someone else define their own primary key, because why would you even do that? Uh, so this is just a way to get a primary key generated for you and just be 100% sure that it's available. That's pretty much what I normally do, unless unless I'm doing something more advanced, which we'll get into later. But we'll just do that, and I'll actually just get rid of this ID that we're taking in, because there's no point in doing that. And then next we have the message, right? So we'll say row dot message equals the message variable that we took in in this in this function here we'll say equals message and now we save it and then now we have to actually compile the contract so i'm going to show you guys how to actually compile a contract now this is the good part where we compile it deploy it to the blockchain and you know actually try to execute this action and and see if it works so we have to open up the terminal again so let me get my terminal window open um, and I always just copy and paste this command because there's no point in even knowing it. So before you actually try to compile the contract, you have to be within your contracts folder right now. So for me, if I just type CD to go back to my root and then I type CT, CD tutorial contracts, 
Now I know I'm in the right folder. I need to be there in order to compile this. It won't work if I'm not in that folder. Uh, and it's the same for you. Wherever your contract is located, you have to make sure you're in that folder. Okay, so the command, which I just copy and pasted and I'm looking at on my other screen, I don't want to lie to you guys, is esio-cpp. And now you're going to put first the name of the file. All right, so in this case, my file up here is called tutorial.cpp. Tutorial.cpp. Next, you're going to put dash o. And then now it's whatever you want the outcome file to be, the WASM file that's going to be generated. Um, if you don't know what a WASM file is, it basically is just a WebAssembly file. Um, right now, when we look at this contract, we have this human readable code here. It ends in .cpp. You can't just upload this to the blockchain. That doesn't work. Machines need to read this code. So that's what I mean when I say we're going to compile it. We're going to convert this CPP file. We're going to convert it into something called WebAssembly so that it's able to be read by machines on the blockchain. Uh, and then we can actually deploy the contract once we're done with that. So this thing right here, this isn't going on the blockchain. We're creating something else um, that's called a WASM file. And anyway, right here after the dash O, we're basically saying what we want the name of that WASM file to be. Typically, I just make this the name of the account where it's going to be um, deployed. I haven't even created that account yet for this video. Let's just say I'm going to create an account called Code Tutorial if it exists. So I'll say Code Tutorial dot Wasm. And then lastly, dash dash ABI gen. Uh, I'll show you guys what an ABI is soon, but just like we have this Wasm file, actually, you know what? I can show you right now. There's also a thing called an ABI. So you see all this stuff here on the EI, uh, on the R Planet contract. It has all these definitions of of the structs. The, these are the different tables, the different actions, all the stuff that's on their contract. You notice how it looks real familiar to this stuff down here, where we defined our messages table and where we defined our action. Well, that's on purpose. It's basically a file that tells people how to interact with your contract, right? It, it gives them the different variables that you've defined, the different tables that exist. And it's kind of like a general outline of like, hey, here's what's in this contract. Here's how you interact with it. Uh, so that's what an ABI file is. When you put ABI gen here, it's basically saying, hey, after you, after you create this WASM file, I want you to also generate an ABI file for me. Uh, you need that or else you're going to get an error, I think, when you try to deploy your contract. So uh, it's important that you put dash dash ABI gen here. And then if we hit enter, let's see how many errors we get. I got an error. Uh, line 40, expected a semicolon. Uh, I missed one after the, after the messages dot in place. I was supposed to put a semicolon. So you can see it, it's very intuitive. It, it gives you information when you... When you have errors, uh, let's try it again. Did I not save it? I'm an idiot. All right, so it looks like it's compiling fun. And it did. So you can see we got this one warning here. It says, warning, action, add message does not have a Ricardian contract. So it's really not that important. I don't ever bother with the recording contract. Some people do. Basically, it's saying that this mess this action that we created right here, add message, it doesn't have a recording contract. Well, what's a recording contract? Well, you know how I just showed you the ABI file that kind of tells people how to interact with your contract. It tells them about the different actions and variables and what they all kind of represent, how to interact with them. Well, a Ricardian contract is, it was originally meant to be some sort of like, I guess like almost a legal layer for EOS contracts where you could kind of put terms that say things like, you know, if this person interacts with this action right here, if they do this add message action, here's what's, you know, legally going to happen or here's the conditions and terms that you're binding yourself to. Uh, that's what that's meant for. I don't really bother with any of that. It's not going to, I mean, it's not going to matter at all. Like you'll get these errors all the time when you compile contracts, but 
everything will work just fine. It's it's just going to tell you this. I don't care if you want to create recording contracts, that's on you. But um, we're not really going to cover that in this video because I don't really think it's important, to be honest. But that's what that is. So now if we go back into our tutorial contracts folder, you can see I not only have the, the password file and the CPP file, I've got these two new ones that just got created, codetutorial.abi and codetutorial.wasm. So this is our smart contract right here, the WASM file. That's the actual smart contract that we're going to deploy to the blockchain. It's going to work. It's going to let us add a message to this table if I didn't make any mistakes. And this ABI file goes right along with it. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. 